Gospel reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. It's, uh, it's sad to say, but if you had a top ten list of the ways I spend my working life, and look at that, I happen to, somewhere in that top ten list would be trying to set times to do my work with other people. That's right. I spend time trying to find time to spend my time. It gives me a headache just to say that. But I'm not alone. Each and every one of you has heard that such and such is happening at such and such time, and we say, let me check my calendar. Or someone emails and said, we need to get together, when's good for you? And I swear, there has to be some sort of algorithm on those sort of emails that takes N, the number of people on the email, and then mathematizes it and gets, uh, determines just how many emails are going to be spent, sent. I'm pretty sure it's just N to the 12th power. Uh, because there's no better way to flood your life with emails. Do you all remember when you've got mail that set, like, gave you a little tingle of excitement rather than a looming sense of dread? Yeah. All that to say, we're busy. Each and every one of us is busy. Some of you all are retired, and you've never been busier. Like, you want to go back to your work week. You're like, it was only 40 then. And that is not to say, and this is to be clear, that your busyness is worthless, but that everything we discussed last week about learning to verb your neighbor better, well, it's going to take time. And that may just seem impossible. This week, we're focusing on chapters 3 and 4 from Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon's The Art of Neighboring. To their perspective, there are two things that serve as barriers to neighboring well, time and fear. Indeed, I think they would have been just as right to say that these two things impede our ability to do anything holy and faithful well. It's always time and fear. Our hope, though, in the tension of this is that we are not alone. From the earliest days, Jesus' followers have struggled with time and fear. We have some resources at our disposal. To wit, we read the story about Martha's frantic work to make sure everything was just right for the dinner party she and her sister Mary were hosting for Jesus and his disciples. Well, I mean, in theory, Mary was also hosting that dinner party, uh, but in reality, there she is just kind of lounging beside Jesus. And Mary, these potatoes aren't going to scallop themselves. Also, life hack, never serve scalloped potatoes at a dinner party. They're just way too labor intensive to be able to attend to your guests. Anyway. Martha is hustling, Mary is chilling, and trouble is brewing until Jesus re-centers the situation. There is need of only one thing. One thing. Jesus is talking about himself here, but I like, to look, I like the call to one thing as a general principle. What would happen if each of us... Uh, 
woke up with one major objective for the day. Not to be sure, now, now to be sure, this, this objective has to be bigger than, you know, clip my toenails. Unless it's been like six months, at which point, yeah, make that your day's objective. But what if we woke up with one organizing principle and then refused to let ourselves get caught up into other people's organizing principles? I think this is what Jesus is recommending. To be sure, Martha, Martha's desire to serve Jesus well is good, but probably, probably she was also feeling enslaved to a whole host of cultural customs and expectations about what it meant to host someone well. I mean, when dignitaries visit, you don't just throw a bag of pizza rolls in the oven and then pull those out 15 minutes later, even if that is what you eat three nights out of the week. So we, are, we see Martha hasn't just chosen Jesus. She's chosen Jesus and cultural expectations. And it was these cultural expectations that were causing her to miss Jesus entirely. If this interpretation is correct, then we see how our time barrier to loving our neighbor is often rooted in self-deception. Martha very likely thought she was choosing only Jesus, but other factors were at play. She just wasn't attuned to their influences on her. This is what makes Pathak and Runyon's list of three lies we tell ourselves so valuable. Because each of these lies gain their most traction in our souls when they work out of the spotlight. Life hack number two, lies never do well in light. So the first lie we tell ourselves, uh, can we try the, this mic? Okay. The first lie is the desperate cultural prayer of the overextended. Things will settle down someday. Hallelujah and amen. Right? You all have said that. Things are going to settle down someday, right? That's your prayer. You fold your hands together and you say, things will settle down someday. No. No, they will not. That's a lie. And they won't. Because the things that need to settle down don't live outside of us. That's what we always assume. It's everything outside of us that's causing the chaos. The things that causes all the busyness, they live inside us. As long as we have a series of competing values, expectations, and norms swirling inside ourselves, we'll find ourselves serving a life prison a life sentence in a prison of our own making. Dave Runyon makes this point particularly well when he tells the story uh, of his son's offer to play in a highly competitive baseball league. Ethan, his son, was blessed with enough natural athletic ability to be selected at the tender age of nine for this opportunity. But the three times a week practice schedule and the 40-game season meant that there was no way he, and by extension his parents, would ever have time to actually love their neighbors. This should feel familiar to many of you. Runyon notes that the things that needed to settle down were not the baseball schedule, but his and his wife's own competitive spirit. Their desire to see their son grow into the great athlete was the thing that called out, was called out by Jesus when Jesus said, there is need of only one thing. This lie is doubled in its influence when paired with another of the lies the author notes. Everybody lives like this. The reasoning goes like this. Well, if Steve and Heather can get their son Joseph into the baseball league, and so can Carrie and Amber and Dax and Lucy, well, why can't we? All of these parents are knocking themselves out to make sure their boys can play. So if we can't do the same, are we worse parents? I have no, I have no doubt that Dave felt that way. I've got to talk to Dave on the phone a little bit because of this Love You See movement, and he's a good man. 
And what sort of good man deprives his child from excellent opportunities? It's hard. This is one of the reasons it is essential that Christians come together in community with one another, which is why this Love You See movement is a multi-church movement. We need to expand our sense of everybody. At the same time, though, this, all, this means that we can't just be full of everybodies that are overextended and time-taxed. We have to be a different people. At a recent Christian Ed meeting, we were discussing maybe expanding midweek to run longer into the year, but we kept running up against the challenge of spring sports. Right now, our organizing principle is to let sports schedules determine a uh, church schedule. Naturally, as the pastor, I have my worries that maybe we've got the wrong one thing in mind. But as we talked through it more and more and more, I felt what parents must always feel like when the church shows up to them and says, hey, we have this excellent opportunity for your child. And that thing I felt wasn't expectation or excitement or joy. It was guilt. I felt guilt. I felt like we were making the church one more thing along swim baseball wrestling track when that wasn't the goal. The goal is for the church to be the place that helps navigate these competing claims on our time, not just become part of the competition. I want, to be the church, uh, the, I want the church to be a place that empowers parents, not just embarrasses them. For the church to be that, though, we have to be a different sort of everybody so that when the cultural myth of everybody lives like this cries out in your mind, you can remember, well, actually, no, not everybody does. I'm part of a people that live differently, and I'm grateful for that. Finally, the last lie, which is more will be enough. This is what we tell ourselves when we have no other reason to keep going forward. We always say to ourselves, yeah, I need a break, but listen, I'm midstream on this thing. It's going to wrap itself up soon. Let me just reach this point, and that'll be enough. Then I can rest, reset, and relax. That's not true. This isn't just a lie, but a gadfly. Every time we want to stop, this lie, more will be enough, bites us and we keep moving. And in the process, our souls get nibbled away out by the edges, little by little. Each of these lies needs to hear the good news that there is need of only one thing. Jesus' holy life was also an unhurried life, which should clue us into the relationship between the two. Never once do we read the Gospels and hear Jesus say, oh shoot, we're running late. Peter, will you text Lazarus and see if we can uh, reschedule? And John, will you bump my meeting with the Pharisees from next Tuesday so that we can take this work trip to Bethsa Bethsaida? Never once. Everyone sees, I barely make it through any given week without having some version of that conversation. If time is one barrier, that fear, then fear is its natural partner in crime. Even if we reprioritize the one thing, these neighbors are still strangers to us, and we are a culture that fears strangers we teach our children about stranger danger. And adults are told, if you see something, say something. We say all of this out of one side of our mouths, while out of the other side, we try to celebrate diversity. And I think if you want to make sense of some of the shootings in our culture, look no further than this sort of cognitive dissonance at play. The Christian view of strangers has to be different. 
we are to never neglect to show hospitality to strangers, which our Hebrews reading gives to us as a, an immoral imperative, but then follows that up with a short story. For by doing so, some have entertained angels without knowing it. This is in reference to Abraham hosting three strangers who turned out to be angels. But the takeaway is what's most important. Behind those strangers is something so much more. Worst case scenario, when you turn and face the strange, when you engage your neighbor who is still a stranger, worst case scenario, you get to host an angel. Best case scenario, you love someone who has been made in the image of your God. In nowhere in that case is fear a worthwhile factor in the equation. I like our Hebrews reading because it really ratchets up the degree to which we are to seek out strangers because it goes on to say, remember those who are in prison as though you yourselves were in prison. Remember those who are being tortured as if though you yourselves were being tortured. Prisoners and torture victims, those are the strangers that Hebrews cites explicitly. All of a sudden, the single dad down the road with two kids and that big Rottweiler doesn't seem as scary, right? That's a little bit more accessible. Yet it is important for Christians especially to remember that not every prisoner lives behind bars. Some have a, a quarter acre and two and a half baths at the end of a sleepy cul-de-sac. In the same way, not all who are tortured bear scars that are visible. I'm glad that Hebrews ups the ante because as we begin to invest in the lives of our neighbors, as we focus on the one thing and turn to face the strange, we're very likely to find folks in prison and lives that, yearn to, that they yearn to see transformed uh, and that lives that are tortured by the same cultural lies that come at us every day. In the end, there are always going to be barriers to loving your neighbor. If you've committed to, to pulling out that insert, and uh, yeah, that's right, you've got it in your bulletin. Bet you didn't think I was going to get there this week, getting late into the sermon, but I need you to take this out again. If you're committed to getting to know and love your neighbors, then you've committed to overcoming these barriers, time and fear or whatever else. And so I want us to, to take a second here uh, at the end of the sermon and look at this card again. Now, last week I asked you to fill in as many details and as many spaces as you could about your neighbors. This week I want you to do something different. Knowing what you do know, or even what you don't know, about who your neighbors are in each of these houses, I want you to write down the barrier you think is keeping the, you from them. And be as specific as you can. Be as specific as you can what barrier might be there. For example, Bree and I only have two neighbors at the back of our house based upon the way the street works. And one of them has a really tall privacy fence. Now, I've seen them enough to like wave from our back door when they're at their back door, and I know enough about them that if ever I find a Frisbee in my yard, it's them, theirs, because they play with their dog. But that's about it. It is not, our relationship is not kind of like home improvement with Wilson. Like, I don't walk back there and get meaningful life lessons. Like, it's just a really tall barrier, even for a tall guy like me. To get to know these neighbors, I'm going to have to walk down my driveway, turn right, walk to the end of my street, turn right again, go to their street, turn right, and walk all the way down and knock on their front door, because there's no way that I can see them, really, from my back. And I'm afraid... I'm afraid, see, it's always there, that to do that is really weird, creepy, and awkward, right? 
But at the very least, right now, what I can do is name that barrier. I can name that barrier as the fence. Each of you have your own sorts of barriers that are keeping you up, uh, keeping you away from your neighbors. Take the time to try to write those down and name them. And once you can name the barriers between you and your neighbors, there is a really good chance that God will find a way to break that barrier down. Because that's what God does. Once there is a barrier between us and our Father in heaven, so he sent his son. When his son was about to, to leave, we feared that barrier would come back. And the Father and the Son, they send the Spirit so that the Spirit dwells in us at all times. God has been proven to be in the business of breaking barriers and erasing borders. And if he can do that with our sin, surely a privacy fence, time, and fear stand no chance at all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.